Hey, so welcome to another episode of Rewiring Health. I'm super excited to be joined by Sarah Leong Lopes. She is a physical therapist and the owner of Phase Physical Therapy and Wellness. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you for having me, Kelly. I'm super excited to talk with you today. Yeah, same here. I know we connected about a year ago, so it's it's kind of cool to see how our journeys have evolved and to yeah. bring us back together again. So it's pretty yes. awesome. Yes, so I, I want to get right into like your story because- I know you help pickleball players now, yes. and um, I know we kind of talked about a few other things we we're going to talk about today, but can you just tell me about kind of where you started, what maybe some struggles you went through, and then how those helped you evolve to what you're doing today? Absolutely. It's funny because like, it's hard to talk about myself, but I also love my story. So <laughs> let's see where this goes. Um, basically, the easiest place to start is at a very young age, I was exposed to the physical therapy world. My mom is a physical therapist. So I was kind of always aware of um, physical health and wellness and the body. She actually even like taught me the anatomical names of the body instead of oh, the wow. common stuff. So I'd call like it the axilla instead of the armpit. And everybody's like, what are you talking about? Um, so from a very young age, I was exposed to the physical therapy world. And I just thought it was fascinating the way that we could look at people's movement and understand what's going on inside their body. Um, and knowing about my body, I felt helped me to um, understand what was going on or be able to assess myself in a moment to moment basis with my, you know, seven year old mind <laughs> as best as I could. Um, but as I was getting older and getting into high school, I was like, you know, I really, really like what's happening with this. And I found that as I was learning from my mom about how to assess myself, I was able to kind of start um, telling my friends and helping to educate my friends a little bit on how to be aware of their body. And I found just a penchant for teaching in that avenue. So I knew that I needed to go into a field that would allow me to educate and just spread knowledge that would help people connect with their bodies. And physical therapy was just the perfect segue because I was already exposed to the world and it was paired with the education aspect of it. So I went through school, I went through grad school, started as a physical therapist, and then quickly realized, oh, I'm not doing as much of the education as I wanted to. Like my time is so limited in the clinics that I was working in. Um, I was able to do a lot, but I wanted to do more. And that led to me um, ending up leaving those clinics and starting my own business, specifically with the pickleball community. Um, again, my parents were the reason why I got into the world because they got super into pickleball. And uh, because they're, that's their whole world and their community. And I love meeting their friends um, and playing the sport myself. Then I was like, okay, let's, let's help connect pickleball athletes to their bodies. And now I'm getting um, that opportunity to educate on people's bodies and connecting them to understanding themselves. And then also um, getting to know other practitioners that maybe don't know about pickleball so that more and more people in the healthcare field can help take care of uh, pickleball athletes whenever injuries or other questions about how to improve their game do come up and so that's where I'm at now just building my business it's really young it's only been like six seven months since I've like started and so it's been really really fun to explore that but it's just fun because I get to educate and that's where my heart is at in the beginning so yeah, yeah. that's that's where I'm at now yeah, I love that. And I think the big message from that for anyone who's like trying to figure out their purpose and their passion is that like, you don't just say, okay, this is where I'm going. It's like life directs you in the oh, ways yeah. that it's meant to. So it's like, nothing is by mistake. It's like, all these things are intentionally moving you in the direction of your purpose. And so I love how you talk about how your parents had such a big influence and then it kind of led you into PT and then, you know, then into pickleball and then <laughs> to like join those, like you can see the stepwise process of like where you started and where you are today. So I think that's amazing. And just yeah. the ability to like serve the community in the way that you want to is just such a beautiful thing because, you know, we, we know with physical therapy, there's a beauty to it, but there's also a lot of restrictions to it. So yes. having the ability to serve people in the way that feels authentic and right to you is just such a beautiful way. Very much about. so. And it's definitely like, I can say this now in retrospect, right? In the moment by moment, year to year, I'm like, I don't know where this is going to take me. But even where I'm at now, looking back, I'm like, okay, I can see where this is going. And then I still have no idea where it's going to take me from here. I just know my trajectory is in line with my values. And so it's, I'm probably going to have fun wherever it takes me as long as I stay yeah. aligned with that. 
Yeah, definitely. And, and there's a big thing I I've been kind of, it's been great in my ingrained in my head and I wish I heard it years ago. Cause it would have really helped, but what you're saying, it really resonates with that. It's like, you can either lead in fear or you can lead in faith and yes. you don't know, no one knows what the future holds. You have no <laughs> idea. So you literally have a choice. You can either be fearful of the unknown, or you could just have faith that it's going to help you figure out where you you're meant to be. So I love that you're, you're leading in that, in that faith ability to like, you don't know what's going to happen, but you just trust the process. Yes. As much as I can. I mean, there's definitely moments that I wake up and I'm like, Oh, fear's like really trying to take the, mm-hmm. take control of the narrative, but yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a daily effort to pick faith over fear. Absolutely. Totally. Yeah, it really is. And I like how you said that too, because it's not just like, okay, you know, you make the decision, everything's easy from then on. Right. Out. That's completely not how it is. Like <laughs> you have the ebbs and flows where you feel like you're on the top of the world. And then you're like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? You know, like, yes. so it's, it's the natural process, but to have a dialogue with yourself where you can get yourself back to that, like balanced state is so important mm-hmm. to do that. Are, do you have a routine or like a self-care routine or things that you do to keep yourself at like that good place where you can be productive and move forward? Yeah, this is something that I've actually been experimenting with a lot because it's changed with every season in my life. The the routine that I had when I was in college was different than when I was in grad school, which was different than when I was working at a clinic, which is different when I changed jobs to a new clinic and even more different now that I'm, you know, creating my own schedule in the morning. So my routine right now that I have found works for me is um, waking up naturally I do try to set an alarm around seven so I'm out of bed for seven um but even better is when my body wakes up naturally at like six or 5 45 and I'm like okay great yes. so um but if I I've learned about myself is that if I'm in bed after seven I just I lose momentum for the rest of the day or it's a struggle to try to build it back up again so something that I've just taken note of myself is like if I can get out of bed by six or six thirty, that's an amazing start of my day Um, And then from there, I kind of have a go to routine where I brush my teeth, wash my face. And if I skip even like moisturizing, or if I skip washing my face, like I notice that it kind of throws me (laughs) off a little bit, like my body loves the affection that I give it by taking the time to brush my teeth and wash my face and moisturize it because I have dry skin. Um, And then after that, I kind of do something that helps to, I go through rhythms of my day. So usually the first rhythm of my day is after I wash up, I wake up my mind. And for me, that's having devotional, that's praying, that's um, reading a book, that's uh, just sitting with myself and doing uh, just mindfulness work uh, with my therapist. I have a mental health therapist and she and I are just working on ways for me to get in tune with my inner self. And so I'll, you know, sometimes that will only take five minutes. Sometimes that will take a whole hour. Um, That's the beauty of my schedule now is I can allow myself that time. And the earlier I wake up, the better I feel about taking a whole hour. Um, And then after I wake up my mind, I do something to wake up my body. Sometimes it's throwing on a song and just dancing all out for five minutes. And sometimes it's going for a walk or going out and playing pickleball that morning, depending on the weather. Um, And then after I wake up my body, I do something that allows me to overview the day, plan for the day. And that helps me to feel ready to go for whatever the mission of the day is um, and to be able to tackle whatever I have on my plate. And usually waking up, that's my self-care routine to help ramp me up. And then my wind down routine is kind of the opposite. I'll do something in movement wise to calm me down. I'll do something brain wise to calm me down. And then I'll brush my teeth and wash my face again at the end of the day. And again, if I miss any of those, my body's like, mm, I don't feel relaxed. And I notice it when I sleep. So yeah. I've, that's something that I've just experimented with and have started to understand about myself is, okay, this is the rhythm that works for me. And it, it benefits me if, I, if I'm able to stick with it and make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many things where you said, I mean, it's so important to have those bookends, like start your day with something that's predictable routine and end it with something that's predictable routine, because we all know life gets in the way in the middle and we can't control that. So if we know we're starting out the day with something for ourselves and we're going to end it with something for ourselves, like it's easier to be more resilient to the things that get, you know, hit you from every direction during the day. Yes, absolutely. So, so important there. And then another thing that stuck out to me and what you said is just 
understanding that you found a routine that works for you. And I think that's important for everyone to understand. It's like, it's not a one size fits all. It's, it's figuring out how you can know yourself well enough to know what you individually need, yeah. because you can look at all these things like, oh, I do this, this, and this, and you can list all these routines from, you know, the best people. And it's like, it may not fit your life and it may not fit what you need. So <laughs> it's great to hear different ideas of what works for different people and then try it. And that's part of the the beauty of it is like, just try something new because our brains will be responsive to that. If it's something new, it may love it, or you may have a lot of resistance and then, you know, it's just not working out for you. So it's, it's really awesome that you found your, your uh, path and like what's worked for you. And also that it worked for this season and Mm -hmm. it didn't maybe work for another season. So that's another thing. Like we're meant to change. And if we don't evolve what we're doing with the change, then we're going to get stagnant. So I think so many important points that you talked about there. Yes. And, and that is one of the reasons why my company is named phase physical therapy and wellness, because I'm wanting to try to embody. It's a reminder to myself, but I'm hoping that it can also act as a reminder to anybody that comes through my business is, Hey, we go through different phases in life. We need to be able to take advantage of those transitions and changes and not, you know, be concerned about what came before or what's coming after, because where you are now and the season that you are at now, there's so much that you can do with it. You just have to experiment and it takes time and it can Mm -hmm. get frustrating to be experimenting like all the time, but Mm -hmm it feels empowering to know that you're learning more about your body in that way. And if you know your body and your brain and what you need in that phase of your life, it kind of helps to inform for the next phase a little bit better as opposed to just being lost all the time. Yeah. Yeah. No, that there's such a great point there because to, first of all, I love your company name. I didn't know that was the reason behind it, but I oh, love yeah. that. That's, that's amazing. And it's so important to be aware of that and expect it. Like what worked five years ago may not work today. And yeah. when you anticipate that, you can say, okay, that's just part of the process rather than like, oh my God, what's wrong with me? This used to work so well for me. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. Like, so you take the blame off yourself, which a lot of people put blame on themselves. Like, oh my gosh, I was so good a year ago. Now I'm just off the routine. Forget it. Like, mm-hmm. and so having an understanding that there are seasons, there are phases, there are times in your life where things are going to evolve and you have to evolve with it is such an important thing to understand. Yes. Agreed. When you talk about phases, like um, as far as stress, like how has that played a role in you with you as far as like maybe when you didn't have a self-care routine or when maybe your self-care routine wasn't fitting what you needed? How did that play a role in your life? Yeah, love this question. So actually last year was a very stress. I called last year my one of my hardest years, but also one of my best years because it was such a huge self-discovery year for me. Um, last year was very stressful because I, I quit my job at an office and I started this business. And so there's a lot of new things that I was learning, new hats that I was wearing. And, um, I took a moment in like the middle of the year to actually start looking at my health because, um, it was really important. And my business coach, Greg Hughes saying, you know, you need to take care of you. If you take care of you, your business will be healthy too. And so I was like, okay, thanks. Um, let's see how I can take care of me. So I started talking to other healthcare professionals and actually taking care of myself and getting just checkups for things that I hadn't before um, and checking in with a pelvic floor therapist and seeing, okay, is that, am I functional? Is there anything hiding that I'm not aware of? Checking with a dermatologist, I've had kind of a skin sensitivities for a long time. And so I finally was getting that addressed and getting answers for that, working with a dietitian nutritionist because I've always had kind of GI issues and last year, I was just noticing weird stuff. So I was like, okay, let's get answers here. Um, on top of just my annual checkup with my physician. And so with that, I was getting a lot of answers, um, with getting answers, it can be stressful too, but it was also very helpful for me to be informed about my body. And I could tell my body was loving the attention it was getting and loving the fact that I was finally paying attention to it. And in that, it kind of was like, as I got information and it could be stressful, my body was also like, oh, we have answers and you're paying attention to us. So it's like able to calm down at the same time. And so as a season for last year, it was very eye-opening for me to take the time and allow myself to cultivate that trust with my body and cultivate that understanding with what I personally needed. And 
like we said, like it was a very different season of my life compared to years prior, but it was starting to retrospectively give me a lot of understanding of why things were the way they were in years prior. Um, and so, yeah, my stress levels, I'm still working on them <laughs> and I'm still learning how to take care of them. Um, but I have a much better understanding now than I did even a year ago. And, um, you know, in the midst of it a year ago, I didn't have answers. In the midst of it now, I don't fully have a routine yet still, but I have answers, whereas mm -hmm. before I did it. So it's it's been an interesting, another journey of, of phasing through that understanding. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And two things, again, that stuck out to me are like, uh, the permission that we give ourselves to take care of ourselves yes. and then the yes. knowledge. And those two things cannot be downplayed when you have permission oh. to take care of yourself. And that's something I actually experienced too with going through Greg Todd's program, because I yeah. thought that I always had to like put everything before my own personal care, because no, this all needs to get done before I can take care of myself. So I always put right. myself on the back burner too. And I hearing from someone who's been through it and, and practices what, is, what he preaches, I was like, oh, wow, like I have to think differently. Like I have to take care of myself. Just like you said yourself, you have to take mm -hmm. care of yourself if you're going to be present and show up with the energy that you need for everything in your life. So yeah. giving yourself permission and even getting permission from somebody outside of yourself can yeah. really shift your mindset and be like, no, this is what has to happen. And then yeah. it becomes non-negotiable. And yeah. then the other thing is the knowledge. Like when you are experiencing symptoms and you don't have knowledge, it's mm -hmm. fearful. It, it just perpetuates the fear cycle of like, I experienced this. It's very real to me. I don't know why I'm doing this. And now I have worse symptoms because I'm in more fear. So having the knowledge and seeking it out, like you did squashes that and breaks that cycle. And now you can figure out, okay, how do I move forward rather than going in this vicious cycle of what I'm experiencing? Yes. So absolutely. Yeah. When you talk about cultivating a better relationship with yourself and figuring out how to get in tune with your body. What do you do to do that, to get into where you feel like your brain and your body are not so disconnected? Yeah, great question. Um, part of it in my journey has come from my mental health and from the conversations I've been having with my therapist. Something that I've been going through is um, internal family systems. It's a method that um, was coined, I believe, I think he coined it and he kind of started developing it more. Uh, Dr. Richard Schwartz, he's another individual who wrote a book on it called No Bad Parts. My therapist recommended it to me and it's been great. But basically internal family systems is saying that we have different parts of ourself that come up when we need support. And they, some of them operate out of fear and some of them operate in response to something that we're lacking, whether it's um, like something that's protecting us, a protector part, or a part that's trying to help you manage things when things get too much, or um, there's even parts that are uh, firefighters that come in and kind of damage control, or um, like your exiled parts, which are the ones that are kind of hidden away because they, they carry too much pain or fear or trauma or whatever. And so going through that, that has helped me get in touch with a lot of the internal experiences that I have and the fears or the um, values that I have on the inside. And for me, that's helped me to become more intuitive to, oh, when I'm in this moment and I'm trying to work on this webinar presentation and I'm trying to make it super like exhaustive and make sure everybody gets all the information that they need. I know that that's my completionist part trying to say, hey, you know, you value information, you value knowledge, you value the whole picture. It makes sense that you're trying to represent it in this, but also you like, I'm learning how to address that completionist part and you know, bring out the true self that's a little bit more compassionate, a little bit more um, creative and confident in just providing the most viable product, which we hear a lot done is better than perfect. And it's very true because the knowledge is getting out there. It's the first pieces of the knowledge and that's gonna help somebody. The completionist part can still get its job done. Maybe we just like drip content or like put it out in pieces instead of all at once <laughs> because that could be overwhelming for some people. So. The internal family systems method for me has been really helpful to cultivate my own intuition because that's allowed me to experiment more with how I respond on the day to day and 
be able to recognize a little bit more like like I have poor um, awareness of when I need to eat. Like I can work for hours on end and forget that I need to eat or need to drink water or I need to probably get up and go bathroom or I need to move. Mm -hmm. So I have like, I'll show you here. I have like a visual timer that I keep so yeah. that um, because I can't do like, if I have my phone nearby with an alarm, I will get tempted to look at my phone. Mm -hmm. And so the visual timer is helpful for me because I can just glance up and see, okay, well, when this goes off, I'm going to get up, stretch a little bit and check in with my body, see if I need to eat something, snack on something. Um, so I've been using different things around or if I know that like I'm in the middle of something mm -hmm. and I need to be like thinky, a good way for me to think is to like play with something in my hands. So like I'll have like little toys that I can like uh, stim with or, you know, use to help me exert some energy even while I'm thinking and stuff like that. And so um, that's been my experimentation is just trying a bunch of different things visually and tactile for me has been the most helpful to cultivate that intuition, build that trust. And then now my body is also knowing like I'm, I'm taking care of it. I'm listening to it. I'm trying to figure out what it needs. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You said so much. I love it. Like there's so many things there The the one thing that like really stuck out to me is that you're the experimenting, figuring again, figuring out what's working for you. And a lot of times when we have those mindsets of like the completionist mindset of like, it's almost like a perfectionist, like this yeah. has to be the way it has to be and nothing else is going to be good enough. And when we get into that, like, unless we question that we're going to continue down that path. And then what happens is that we end up getting things just to numb us from how that creates so much turmoil within ourselves. So we right. feel like we're perfectionists. Now our systems and turmoil, we're not addressing our needs. And then we go to something to like, just mindlessly numb it to deal mm -hmm. with it. So it's like, again, breaking that cycle. Like you recognize this is what my internal dialogue is. You questioned it. So yeah. do I really have to have this done? Do I really have to make it perfect? Like, how is that serving me or even yeah. serving the people that I'm serving? And then you change what you're doing and then figured out how you can now get into a place that you're responding to your body cues, responding to your needs. And now you're stopping that stress cycle. You have healthy mechanisms for dealing with it. It's like, you can see how everything just goes into a better direction once you recognize the change that you need to make. And like the clock, love that. That's a great idea. And especially taking it off your phone where a phone can be very much of a numbing mechanism and yeah. escapism in not a healthy way. And yeah. then also the, the fidgeting, because there's actually a lot of science to that, that when we have a stress response, we have to release that physically. It's like a mm -hmm. lion that goes to a, attack its prey. There's a physical release of his adrenaline and yes. then it's okay. It goes back to normal, but as humans in the modern world, we get a stress response and we sit. And mm -hmm. then we have this, this pent up stress and we don't know how to handle it. So just adding something like fidgeting or going up for a mm -hmm. walk or doing something, that's your release. And so now it allows you to move forward rather than being stuck. Absolutely. So, and for yeah. me, in my experience, I have a lot of issues with like inertia, you know, like an object mm -hmm. that's in motion stays in motion an object. Yeah. And that includes even an object that's not moving. So for me, if I haven't been moving I recognize that it feels like it takes so much effort to move. So starting with this is a really nice way to get me moving. And then sometimes from there, especially because I, my chair is like a swivel chair, I'll just like swivel in that or I'll shake in the middle of the chair because it's not demanding me to stand up, which sometimes can take a lot of energy and a lot of effort, um, whether it's physical effort or like mental effort. And so that's kind of one way that's helped me to and that's something that I've also just learned in the last like seven months is that that's something that works for me because especially when I'm stressed and I'm not aware of the, you know, signals my body is telling me, I know that I can at least trust on this visual timer. This is off of Amazon is like very like this one's a 60 minute one. They have one for like different intervals, but um, I know that when that goes off, my body knows that I'm going to be checking in with it. I'm going to be swiveling. I'm going to be shaking. And once I do that, that will probably get me to stand up and address whatever else is needing attention. So yeah. it's, but again, that's like super recent. If we talked a year ago, I would not have those tools yet. So yeah. it's, it's very, very recent. 
Yeah, it's amazing. And you can see how it stacks on one another. Like your the timer goes off, you start fidgeting, moving, now yep. you're getting up. Like it's it's just stacking. And this is like your routine that you've established. And mm-hmm. there is a lot of science to that. If you look at like, I mean, my baby, my dog, like when I see them like sleep for a while and then they wake up, the first thing they do is like stretch, they yep. breathe, like it's called pandiculation. They're actually priming their nervous system to get moving. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing, you're priming yourself for movement. And that's why it doesn't feel like it's so much resistance to like go from sitting to standing, like, okay, now this is just the natural progression of what I do. Exactly. Yeah. And it's just, it's awesome that you have such a routine and I think it's really impactful to see what you're doing because for someone who's like, oh my gosh, that's how I feel. Like here are some tools you can start implementing that really do work and, and just try them. Like that's the big Mm -hmm. thing. Just give it a try. What's the harm in trying to do something different? Exactly. Exactly. And in my mind, I tend to get hung up on the, oh, like you have to you know, try it, stick with it for two weeks or stick with Mm -hmm. it for one month and see if it works for you. And I'm like, sometimes I get five days in and my body's already telling me, nah, this isn't going to cut it. And that's (laughs) something else that I've had to learn about myself because when I first started doing it, I sometimes wouldn't be able to pick up on, oh no, this isn't working for me um, in the first five days. Now I can start picking up in the first five days. Oh, this, this routine isn't working for me. But a lot of it comes from that um, internal parts work from journaling from um, just seeing like how do I feel like how do I actually feel after I do these things and in the hours following as well um, because then if it if it feels good then I'll keep doing it if I'm like wow that took way more effort and I do not enjoy it then okay there's going to be another version of this that I will enjoy um, and I never try to force myself to enjoy anything (laughs) anymore in that way like I've learned that going to a gym to do weights isn't necessarily fun for me but if I have weights at home then I can enjoy that better and maybe that's just you know how it is for me or I don't necessarily enjoy running but I do enjoy you know running with friends so I will never try to force myself to run by myself like I'll run on the phone with a friend or in person with a friend and it's just finding different variations and saying like, okay, does this actually feel good? Mm -hmm. Or does it feel like I'm, it's a framework that I've bought into and I have to pursue it just because that's what everybody else says is good for me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. That the thing is, and that's okay. Like what you're Mm -hmm. saying, and that's okay. And that's okay. Yes. Like it's okay. If you read 10 magazines that tell you, you should be running five miles a day and you hate running that's okay to not run by yourself for five miles. Like that's okay. And, and sometimes again, it's that permission. Like I don't have to follow what everyone else is telling me to do. I have to follow what my heart is telling me to do. And it's Mm -hmm. that difference between I need to versus I want to. Yes. And that can be a really hard thing to differentiate, especially if you're very disconnected from yourself. Do you need to do it or do you generally want to do it? And that's, Mm -hmm. that's a question before you engage in anything, you should be asking yourself, do I want to do this or do I need to do this? Yeah. And then, and then prog- progress forward with just the wants. Yes. And of course there's things in life we need to do, but when we talk right. about like showing up for ourselves, that's when we get to do what we want to do. And yes. That's, that's so important. Absolutely. When talk about safety, because that's a big thing. When we feel like we're not safe, then now we have this stress response because we're trying to protect ourselves. How did you cultivate an environment of safety and where you feel like I am safe to grow? Because again, our first thing that we need to do for anyone as a human is to first feel safe and protected, and then it opens up the door for growth. So how have you allowed yourself to feel safe enough to grow? Great question. Um, To answer this, I actually want to go back in time to when I was a kid and acknowledge the difference between like perceived safety and like actual safety so growing up I as a kid like I was safe I had a loving family I was blessed that you know we didn't have a lot of um, issues necessarily growing up so I knew that I would always have a roof over my head I knew that I would have food I knew I had parents that loved me and and a sister as a best friend even though we like didn't always get along growing up, but then we yeah. ended up later. Um, so environmentally, I I knew logistically I was safe, but on the inside, there was just always this angst and anxiety that I tended to carry with me. And 
I didn't really know what it was from growing up. And so that resulted in a lot of constipation, actually. That was like my, G that was the first sign that I had GI issues, which is why I started working with a dietitian nutritionist now to get answers. Mm -hmm. um, and also the pelvic floor therapist helped to explain that as a child too, was that I carried so much anxiety as a kid. And um, looking back in the last year as I was reflecting back retrospectively, I started understanding why it was because I actually have a very sensitive um, like sensory system, especially regarding like taste and texture. And a lot of what my family liked to do was to go out to eat with friends. And for me, um, I would get anxious, I guess, as I've been looking back, I would get anxious going out to eat at restaurants that I wasn't familiar with. I didn't know the menu. Um, I didn't know what was in the food. And because I knew that sometimes when I, we would go out to eat in the past, I would get stomach aches from it, or I would end up having to spend the majority of the time in the bathroom or coming back and forth from the bathroom because I just, I didn't feel good. And then that would induce another type of anxiety because I was like, oh, like people are noticing I'm leaving to go to the bathroom all the time. Um, and sometimes it was the actual food that I ate. Sometimes I think it was just the social aspect and the memories that I had of these stressful situations, even though I knew the people around me loved me, I knew they were concerned for me, they cared for me logistically, I had nothing to worry about, but there was something not right in my body. Um, and so back then I knew I had safety, but I didn't feel safe for whatever reason. And like, bless the heart of all the people around me, they're trying to tell me like, Sarah, you're fine, you have nothing to worry about, like appealing to that logistical sense, but logic was gone. Yeah. <laughs> like there was, there was no consolation um, mm -hmm. from that aspect. But now looking back and seeing that and the ways that I've cultivated now, I have better strategies to create that actual emotional sense of safety. Um, so if I go out to eat now, like sometimes, yes, yeah, still I'll get a little bit anxious, but like now I think ahead to, oh, let's look at the menu ahead of time and like see what's in it. If I really have concerns, I'll call the restaurant and ask questions about the ingredients or the menu, or um, I will look at pictures ahead of time. So if I do happen to get anxious or need to go to the bathroom, I know exactly where it is. Um, and I have a backup um, meant like order if I, the order, the item that I wanted to order isn't available or anything like that. So like when I'm going out to eat, that's something that I've done to help accommodate myself. Um, and then at home, I just have a lot of a lot of things around me that make me feel safe, um, like toys that I can stim with. I have a blanket mm -hmm. um, that I actually got when I went on was on a mission trip in Peru. So it's like alpaca wool, and I love the feeling of the alpaca wool. Uh, my husband bought me a weighted blanket for Christmas because I love getting yeah. like deep squish hugs yeah. ever since I was a kid. And he's like, okay, like let's, let's get a weighted, weighted blanket because a lot of people enjoy mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I have just, I'm, <laughs> this is kind of leaning into just things I'm interested in. Um, I love Disney and I love Disney parks. I loved the movie Tangled. And so I've surrounded my stuff, myself with stuff that remind me of Disney or help to inspire me from the movies and shows that um, and the parks that I so love and feel safe about because it just brings out something in me and so all these environmental things around me even though logistically I know I'm safe those mm -hmm. things help address the sensory needs that I have specifically with touch um, with taste with visual things that I can look around my room and up away from my computer um, to help calm me down and help me emotionally and sensorily feel safe in addition to like the things I know that I can check off are safe. Yeah. Yeah. The big thing there, I love how you point this out because there's so many people this is going to resonate with that you grew up in a good environment. Like you, yeah. like, you think, like, why do I not feel safe? Like, what is wrong with me? Like I have a good family. I have all my basic needs met. Like mm -hmm. what is going on? And like, I had the same experience. Like I had a good uh, childhood and like, I'm like, why do I feel like I am always anxious. There's no real reason. Like I didn't have anything that happens. Like I never 
you know, experienced anything that was alarming. And mm -hmm. so thank you for bringing that up because again, there's so many people that's going to resonate with that's like had a good upbringing and didn't have those like typical like traumas that can initiate a lot of that. Yeah. But here we have a situation where you're not feeling safe because of other reasons. Mm -hmm. And to be able to recognize that, that safety doesn't mean just physically you're unsafe. It means like, are you emotionally safe? Are you mentally safe? Do you feel like all your deep needs are met? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's also safety. So it can very well be like that big trauma that you had growing up that can spawn into that, or it can be these other things that just did not get met. And, and then you compound it, especially when you're younger, where you think there's something innately wrong with me. Right. And again, there's that knowledge where you take the blame off yourself. This is a, an actual reason why you're experiencing what you're experiencing. And now once you have that, that's your step to figure out what do I need to do to get in a better place? And clearly with everything you've implemented, you've figured out how to get yourself in a better place where you're not feeling unsafe. So I yeah. love the examples you, you gave because they're so specific to you. And again, there's another example that it's not one size fits all. It's what right. Right. Um, right. Yeah. And, and it's definitely worth mentioning. Like I would not have gotten these answers if I didn't talk to people who had the expertise. Mm -hmm. And that's why I love what you're doing with your podcast Thank is you. you're helping connect people to that information for questions that they have in a very safe way, in a way that meets those specific needs and encourages them to experiment with that. Because for me, that's been pivotal in me discovering things about me, about my brain, about yeah. my, my sensory needs and, and the way that I need to live life and allow myself to, to not be so black and white and mm -hmm. rigid in my thinking. Um, and, and actually experiment and be willing to sit in those gray areas and try to figure out how to make it work. And it's not comfortable all the time. Yeah. It does take work. I'm not saying that like, oh yeah, everything's better now because I'm like experimenting. Yeah. Like, no, it takes, it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of intentional effort and it sometimes can be even more tiring to be putting in that much effort. Um, but when, when I hit my stride, I'm like, oh, it was totally worth the effort. Mm -hmm. And that's what I seek out whenever I'm trying anything to see like, is this something I want to do versus is this something I need to do? And oftentimes once I want to do it, the need gets filled mm -hmm. um, because of the, the trajectory that I'm going on. Yeah. Yeah. And just to talk on resources, having the right resources, having the right support system, because the biggest things in life are not meant to do alone. You're not right. meant to get through this alone. Like right. if you, think you can, then you're, you're misinterpreting how big of a battle some things can be. Yes. So take the resources, take the support system, no matter what it is. If it starts out with a podcast that makes you think of the next step, again, going back to, you don't have to have all the answers today, but you just have to have the next step. So hopefully something for anyone who's listening, if it resonated with you, take this, take a, a next step to where you can take that. And then now you're at a different level and now you can figure out the next step from there and just go at a graceful pace that works for you. Because if you try to force it, you're going to throw yourself back into a bad place. So you just got to take those stepwise steps to get to where you're going to. Yes, absolutely. So, and yeah. again, just to anybody listening, please look out for any any healthcare provider resources that you trust and you have permission to ask them questions you don't have to sign on and stick with them forever you you have permission to try it out and if you don't like it move on to someone else and yes it will take energy to have to be talking to a bunch of new people but once you fit once you find your match it is it just gels it's like meeting a best friend the first time and you just know that it's going to be a good relationship so allow yourself to experiment even with the people that you consult with. 100%. You have to have the right fit. You yeah. can't force it. If it's not the right fit, you're going to know, like you're yeah. going to, like you should go to bed and be like, Oh my gosh, I'm so happy. I met that person. I feel like I'm in a different place versus like, Oh gosh, I got to meet with them again. I really don't want to do this. Like yeah. that's the difference in feeling. And you shouldn't feel like that. It should feel like, okay, I feel like I'm finally on the path of someone who is looking out for me and can help me. And like yeah. you said, just ask questions to begin with. Like you don't have to commit to anything right up front, figure mm -hmm. out who your person is and then go with it. So yeah. thank you for that input. Such, yeah. such a great piece right there and something to take forward <laughs> yes. for, for anyone who wanted to connect with you and reach out to you, where can they find you and how can they do that? 
Yeah, would love to connect with you guys and um, get you plugged into my world too, especially if you're interested in pickleball or just general wellness for that. Um, so you can find me on Instagram and Facebook at phase PT and wellness. That's all spelled out phase P-H-A-S-E, P-T, A-N-D, and then wellness. I don't want to use all those syllables, <laughs> but you can find me on Instagram and on Facebook there. Um, you can also go to my website, connectwithphase.com. It will also have links to my podcast where I talk about pickleball injury recovery and prevention, and as well as direct links to my Facebook and my Instagram. And those are the best ways to hear what I'm doing, to connect with me directly. Um, and I'd love to help answer any questions that you have about um, pickleball and get you connected with areas in your, uh, with courts in your area. So you can mm -hmm. give it a try and play and play safely and confidently so you can really enjoy the game and play as many games as, as you want for the rest of your life. Yeah, love that. And I will put everything in the show notes. So if you missed it, it'll all be there. You can check out that and get connected with Sarah. And maybe pickleball could be that thing that you try. If you're not already a pickleball player, maybe that's your new thing. Like, let me try this and see how it fits into my life. And if it resonates, yep. like what a great resource to have to get something fun and new in your life to experiment where you can take you. So thank you so much, Sarah. I yes, truly enjoyed this you, conversation. Kelly. I really did. I had so much fun too. Yeah. Thank you so much awesome. for having me. Oh, absolutely. And for anyone who has questions for myself or Sarah, leave them in the um, comments or um, leave a review and, and we will be more than happy to answer those. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the podcast. Um, your views, your listens, your shares all help promote the podcast so that more people can be reached and more people can be helped. So thank you for everything you do. And thank you for coming on today. My pleasure, Kelly. Thank you so much for what you do yes. too. I'm oh, super excited you. for everything that you get, you've been doing on this. Oh, thank you so much, Sarah. It's been a pleasure. Yes.